from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I am very pleased to welcome you to yet another program in our series uh, at North Idaho College on the North Idaho College Public Forum. Our guest today is a former member of the faculty at North Idaho College. She's returning. It's like a reunion for us. I welcome to the program Leona Hassan. <clears throat> the purpose for her being here today is to celebrate her new book that she has written and I would like to show to our viewers. It's called At the Foot of the Beartooth Mountains and I have a copy here with me today. Uh, Leona, congratulations. I know that you've spent a number of years putting this together and uh, it is now uh, a realization. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a book about the Finnish people uh, in America, particularly this case uh, in Montana, uh, as we've indicated at the uh, Red Lodge, Montana, uh, a settlement of the Finnish people. Our guest, uh, at, when she taught at North Carolina College, was an expert in the languages and taught languages. She's had tours to uh, Finland on a number of occasions where students would go with her. In fact, I had the pleasure of going twice with her to Finland. Uh, she is certainly an expert on the subject of the history of the Finnish people. She also received a Fulbright grant to be in Finland and has spent a lot of time there and, and it's Finnish herself, so she's certainly highly qualified to address this subject. Leona, welcome to our program. It's a pleasure to have you back on campus and I would like to add in, in this introduction that while you were here for years, you chaired the Convocations Committee and you and I worked together on the bringing speakers here and you brought some of my favorite people here, uh, such as uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Fletcher, who was a great theologian and was the chair of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s PhD committee. We thank you for your past work and we welcome you back. Thank you. As always, I'm pleased to have our regular panelists. Uh, first of all, it's Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Schink, who is the vice president of college relations and development at North Idaho College. And we shall ask today to, for Janelle to commence our questioning with Leona Hassan. It was a great pleasure to read your book. It's very enjoyable, it's interesting, informative, and it moves right along. Um, one of the things that I gathered from reading the book is that as Finnish people came to the United States or to this country and to Canada, they formed settlements, and those were particularly close-knit settlements. Is that true? Yes, certainly. Um, I think I mentioned in the book that Carl Ross in his book says that those particular organizations that they set up served as a security blanket for them. And that way they felt more at home. They created their own little Finland wherever they were. And uh, it was very true, certainly very true in Red Lodge. Now, what was the everyday life like for a person who was living in a Finnish settlement? Well, Red Lodge was a coal mining town, so of course the men were down in the mines, and the women uh, did what women did at that time, I guess, of canning and making clothing, a good deal of weaving, because they did weave all of their rugs and uh, other kinds of clothing, handiwork, and gardening. They usually had a garden in the backyard. And they perpetuated the language, as I oh, understand yes. it, that they would yes. continue to speak in, in the Finnish language. Yes, they certainly did, to the point that uh, at one particular point, uh, people in the community other than the Finns used to resent the fact that the Finns really didn't have to learn English to get along in Red Lodge, because there were always Finnish people in the stores, always people in the offices who spoke Finnish so they could do all their business in Finnish. One of the things that was interesting to me was the sauna, the whole concept of a sauna. Can you explain for our readers what the place of a sauna was in life? Well, it's certainly life. Uh, all of the farms in the area had their own private saunas. But in town then, there were, oh, at the time I was growing up, there were three commercial saunas that uh, had a, a day on, on Tuesday and on Saturday that people could go and uh, to the sauna, and all of these saunas were, uh, so they had a men's side and a women's side, but they, one of them was larger who al that also had rooms so that families could go together. And uh, this was 
something that was just considered to be part of part of living. You went to the sauna once a week at least. And if you lived in a boarding house, that would probably be particularly true. Is that correct? Or did the boarding houses have their own? Usually not. They, they went to the commercial ones. But a good number of people did live in boarding houses, oh, yes. isn't that true? And they would oh, live yes. in Finnish boarding houses right. where the language was spoken, right. and the meals were probably cooked in a Finnish style. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that for quite a while, the Finnish food uh, was similar to what they had in Finland. But little by little, when they got more uh, acquainted with the kinds of vegetables or fruits and so on that were available here, they ought, began to make a few adjustments in that. But Really, and not until the ethnic groups began to meld, in a way, did other nationality foods come into the Finnish kitchen. Usually, it was just Finnish cooking. Steve Sheen. Leona, if I may, and first of all, let me congratulate you on what, what you've accomplished here. It's, uh, I think, an important contribution to your heritage and to, and to a community that I know and admire very much. And I want to I want to set a little bit of a backdrop and talk a bit more about Red Lodge, Montana, if we can. Could you tell our audience, uh, who, as you know, are, are pretty broadly scattered, um, where Red Lodge is in Montana and a little bit more about the town? All right. Red Lodge is, uh, as far as tourists are concerned, is considered to be the northeast entrance to Yellowstone Park. Mm -hmm. We have a, uh, a road that goes from there over the Beartooth Mountains into Yellowstone, to Cook City and into Yellowstone. So it's uh, in which, this which I think Charles Corral called the most beautiful drive in America. Right, right. Had to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a few miles from Wyoming, mm -hmm. and uh, the southern part, and way up in the mountains at 5,500 feet. So we have good, solid Montana winters. And you've already told us that it was essentially a coal mining town. That's the, that's, that's its right. genesis. How big was the town when you were growing up there? When I was growing up, and uh, well, when I went to high school, let's put it at that point, there were about uh, 3,200 people. Uh, at its height, there were about 6,000. Uh, Montana uh, numbered its, its uh, license plates on the population that was in the counties. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carbon County, which is Red Lodge County, um, had what was number 10. So it was at one time, I think Billings was only a few thousand bigger than Red Lodge was in about 1917 or 1918. Mm -hmm. But now it's about 1,800. About 1,800 people. How long ago did the coal mines play out? Uh, one played out in 24, the other one in 32. And, in 34. and today the economy is basically what? Tourism. It's a county seat. Farming. That's about it. Now, if, if I may, what I'd, what I'd like to do for just a second is, is turn to some basic information about your book, because I, I, I've got to believe that at the end of our show today, there are going to be other people out there who are going to say, yes, I should do this too. Um, what would you say to them? How big an undertaking was this? It was a big undertaking, but one that I was really looking forward to because uh, my father has always been interested in history, always supported the Finnish community, and they were pack rats. They collected pictures and letters and books and uh, all of the, uh, the posters that I have in there relative to the plays and so on were all collected by my folks. And so I had a good amount of research material to begin with. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are other people that have these in their basements, attics, and they should do it before it gets too late. How, how much time did you invest in this About product? About five years. About five years. And of course, you're an educator, so you, you have a background in research and writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a self-published book? Yes, Is that it correct? Is. Do you mind sharing with the audience a little bit about what was involved in, in, um, in accomplishing that publishing task? Well, I had a long list of people that I was in contact with, and, and so I contacted them in, uh, I guess, about 1992 or 93, telling them I was interested in, buy in doing the book, and would they be interested in buying the book pre-published uh, uh, pre price. So it gave them about a $5 saving if they bu bought it beforehand. So we were able to get enough people, about 160 people, purchased the book beforehand, and uh, that paid for the editing. 
And then after that, I put in the money for the publishing. And the uh, Carbon County Historical Society uh, also supported in the publishing. And when those are paid off, then all of the profits go to the, to the uh, Carbon County Historical Society in Red Lodge, which is also building a museum. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That, that is a real interesting process. Uh, let's talk a, a little more about the Finnish people that you, uh, you're honoring, <coughs> of course, with this book, um, both at uh, Red Lodge uh, and in Finland itself, there is still certainly a tie. And as you go across the northern tier of the United States anyway, through Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Montana, and Idaho, there's a lot of Scandinavian people, and there's a lot of people that are Finnish. Um, would you share a little bit from the book about some of the uh, kinds of characteristics that the Finnish people brought to uh, Red Lodge that they maintained, uh, at least in the early history, and, and are they continuing those traditions today? Uh, that they brought from the mother country? Well, at the time that a great many of the Finns were moving from Finland, uh, Finland was under Russia at that time. Right. It was a grand duchy. And uh, Tsar Nicholas came in and began to pressure them considerably more than the other Tsar had. And people were not satisfied with this. And at this time, the Enlightenment had been moving in to Finland, people were interested in labor movements and in more freedom and the women's rights and this sort of thing. And since Tsar Nicholas was not in favor of that, people were left as, as quickly as they possibly could. And so that's when the greatest portion of people came to the United States and to Canada. And they brought with them those ideas of labor unions and um, rights of the, of the workers and also women's rights and so on. And they took those into their communities. And so I think you found that wherever the Finnish communities were settled, that uh, these people were right in the fray, right from the beginning. If there was, a, especially during the 19, early 1900s when the, when the uh, labor unions were attempting to begin, and uh, the Finns were in there fighting for their rights and creating all sorts of difficulties for themselves from time to time. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> they were really quite, on the, on the ideological spectrum uh, in political philosophy, they were quite liberal or progressive, being supportive of labor unions and also the struggle for the women's right to vote, which came in the year 1920. And, al and also with regard to helping, helping the people for social welfare programs, they set up uh, programs in the, in the temperance societies for, for their accident and, and illness insurance programs. Also on the farms, they set up a, um, a, an assurance company that uh, helped them in case they had fires on the farms and so on. It's been a long time since the early part of the century. In fact, we're getting ready to move into a new century uh, very soon, a new millennium. It's a real interesting time to, to watch this transition. Uh, as you look today at, at almost the close of the century, uh, we still have communities like Red Lodge and others that are uh, with a very significant Finnish population. Have they maintained that same political philosophy or have they changed over time as... as uh, oh, they, they've been absorbed into the American culture really quite well, as all of the ethnic groups in Red Lodge have. And I think that came about, as I mentioned in the book, during, especially during the um, Depression since everybody stood in the same lines to get food or they were working for the WPA or for the CCCs. And this brought them together and they began to have programs together. Little by little this developed to the point where Red Lodge set up its Festival of Nations in the 50s in which they bring all of the ethnic groups together and it's a celebration that goes on for about seven or eight days. One more question before I go back to the panel, and that you, you just suggested that with your answer. That is, in addition to the Finnish uh, community at Red Lodge, what are some of the other ethnic uh, and Ita national origin groups? Italians, probably as many Italians as Finns. So the Finns were about one third, the Italians about one third, and then, then the Yugoslavs, the various Slavic groups, Austrians, 
And then, of course, the English-speaking, the Anglo-Saxon group, which was much smaller. Janelle Burke. The Finns were organizers. In your book, you talk about a number of different organizations that they formed. Um, can you tell us about some of those organizations? Uh, what did they do? And they built, they built really quite nice halls, um, uh, and they were very involved in activities when you consider the size of the community. What were some of the organizations? Well, perhaps the first organization that was set up was the Temperance Hall. And the first Temperance Hall was very rigid. And some people didn't like to dance, and some people wanted to dance. And so they split up almost immediately. And so they set up another Temperance Hall. And uh, eventually, the more liberal Temperance Hall remained. And within that organization, they, they had their bands, and their athletic groups, and their children's groups uh, that they taught uh, in terms of, of plays and singing and so on. And um, your they all, uh, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Your family was very involved in drama. Yes. And so can you share with us what it must have been like to be involved in a dramatic production at that time? Well, my. Well, my father came to Finland in 19, I mean, to Red Lodge, in, almost like Finland, in, to Red Lodge in 1915. He was hired by the Workers' Hall, which had been another hall that had grown up because of the political movement, the, um, the labor movement, and the workers' movement had set up this other hall. And so he became the director of the plays, and they put on a... Uh, three-act or four-act play once a month, a one-act play every other week, or once, once uh, in between. And then uh, the children's programs were given also, dances on every Saturday. And uh, the plays were, my, my father was very, very well read, so he insisted on not always having the propaganda type of plays but he wanted to have good drama also. And so he interspersed those two. And uh, all of the people really were involved in these in some way or other. This was a community affair, a community production, is that oh, yes. correct? Oh, yes. And, and music played a very big part. There were yes. choruses and yes. bands, orchestras right. to do the accompanying. Right. And the, and the children, as they learned to be in small plays, little plays, they gradually, as they grew up, they were so accustomed to that, they moved into the adult presentations. Did outsiders come in then, too, as well, um, to, uh, to present musical events oh, or oh, so Oh, you forth? mean in the halls? Yes. Oh, yes, because the Finnish halls were basically the only performance uh, milieu or the, the uh, locale that they could have anything in. And so there were lots of, of plays that came in from the outside. Traveling troops. Traveling troops, right. And they also had all kinds of, of athletic events as well. They were very competitive, apparently. Right. They had a gym, and they, they had uh, young fellows who were rather well trained in certain athletics, training the young people. And then later on in the 1920s and 1930s, they created uh, sort of tournaments within the towns and so on. And the Finns were very much involved with this also. Steve Sheen. Leona, um, you mentioned that much of the research for your book came from a pretty extensive family archive. And yet there is so much information here. I, I have to believe you did a great deal of oh, additional yes. research. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, how were you greeted? In, in the uh, Finnish community as you went around and gathered information for, for the book? How, how did people react to the fact that you were doing this? Oh, well, I knew everybody, mm -hmm. and they just took me in as a family member, and whatever I wanted, I had. Were they happy with the idea, though, that someone was going to do a, a, a history of the Finnish community in Red Lodge? Oh, yes. Any yes, interview uh, stand out in your mind as, as particularly worthwhile or poignant or...? Well... Perhaps, perhaps the uh, one I did with Hanna Ukola, who at that time was about 100 years old, uh, and very, very bright, and remembered everything. And she just had so many wonderful stories of the old days and 
also stories about Finland and, and before, before she came and then after she came. And that perhaps was a, a really an outstanding interview. But certainly Tentokovsky, in terms of the, of the music, was, was outstanding. And everybody was very helpful. The men down in, in the Roberts area, the farming area, uh, I had one of the gals at the um, uh, courthouse get me the maps of the farming area, and they went through and told me or indicated all of the old timers who owned the farms before the uh, origin or the uh, present day owners, and everybody was glad to do it. But it did take time. What gave you the original idea? My father. It was something he wanted you to do. No, not necessarily. But oh. he was just. It was just his his. Uh, whole demeanor about keeping track of things that are happening and doing things and being sure that you didn't forget where you came from and what you were doing and where you were going. So, so in some ways this was a book you felt you had to do. Yes. Is there, is there another book out there that you feel you want to do? Oh, I have several ones in mind. <laughs> a anything in progress at the moment, or are you going to wait for a while? And oh no, and no. I'm as as soon as I as soon as I get rid of all of the paperwork of this and and clear my files and my word processor, I will start on the next one. Which I have a collection of letters from a Finnish miner who came to Red Lodge in 1905 mm -hmm. and wrote regularly to his mother in Finland and saved all her letters and went back to Finland after she died and she had saved all his letters. Mm -hmm. And I have all those letters and all the other letters that he got. And so I'm planning a big thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. As I indicated at the beginning of the program, I have had the privilege of going to Finland with you twice and one of my favorite cities in the world is Helsinki. And one thing I learned from you, Leon, and the people of Finland when I was there is because that they were under the jurisdiction of the Tsars in Russia, uh, since that independence earlier in the century, they have had a great appreciation of, of being sovereign and independent and also of their roots and their history. And I saw that in the pride of their museums and their collection of their literature and, and, and their crafts and their arts. Is that same kind, and you mentioned about your father, is that same kind of devotion to the history here in these communities in the United States? And if so, is that because that they found that there was such a long time that they didn't have that opportunity to preserve so much of their history like other countries have been sovereign for a long time? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether, I, I don't really know how to answer that, Tony. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that, that people want to hang on to their to their background mm -hmm. and so on. And certainly the, the one organization that is still viable in Red Lodge is, are the Kaliva Knights. And that was started in 1898. <clears throat> and they uh, are still working. And they have, people have become considerably more interested in it than at one time it had sort of petered out. But uh, I think that they have they have a lot of people who belong to it, and also in the women's organization. Uh, in fact, while I was there this summer, they asked me if I would come over and teach them, teach people who wanted to uh, learn Finnish some Finnish. And so a friend of mine from New York, who was also Finnish, was there at the same time. And we, so they asked how many of them were interested in doing it. They asked the women's group, and there were 35. And they hadn't asked the men's group yet. So we decided that it had to be almost a year-long program <laughs> with many, many levels and so on. But that, we won't do it that, to that extent. But they are interested. They're uh, interested in keeping that. I just got that impression when I was there that, that it's, it's beyond the uh, ordinary about their commitment, interest in their history and its preservation. Uh, a couple of questions, quick questions, about uh, one of the things about the Finnish people that I really enjoyed very much was the food. Would you share with our viewers that have not had exposure to the Finnish uh, wonderful food. Mm. What part of some of the highlights that, that are uh, used to? They, 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 uh, they use a lot of casseroles, casserole dishes. And um, 
they have a turnip dish that I never liked. <laughs> uh, also a carrot, a, a carrot and rice casserole. I don't know whether Tony you ate that or not. Um, I know um, people very very often like the oven pancakes that they make. Um, Mike Bundy is especially fond of, of the finished pancakes. One of our faculty members here. Yeah, one of the faculty mm -hmm. members here. They also are very well known for their pastries. Yes, uh, and especially the uh, cinnamon rolls that have the cardamom in them. We're getting short on time. I want to go to another thing. When we were in Finland, uh, religion was of interest to me, and there were two state churches. Uh, they don't have the same concepts we do of the First Amendment separation of church and state. Uh, would you share our viewers, uh, with our viewers a little bit about the religion and, and, and the, the key religious uh, uh, denominations or religious organizations? It's a Lutheran church. And uh, then the other, the other one is the uh, Greek Orthodox. A uh, very small percentage of the of the Finns in in uh, Finland belong to the. I, I think only about ten percent belong to the Greek Orthodox, um, and everybody really belongs to the Lutheran Church, even though they don't go to church, and they pay, everybody pays a state tax based on on the on the Lutheran Church also, so. Uh, that's the religion that the Finns brought over here was the Lutheran religion. And those are the two state churches in yes. Finland today. And yeah. I noticed on the, they're more active on high holidays or, or for ceremonial purposes or weddings or funerals. Then the, then the Lutheran church becomes more significant to them. Uh, I, 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 I agree with you. I noticed that there was a lot of uh, individuals that don't go regularly, but uh, that still is their identification. With that, I'm going to have to bring our program to a conclusion on behalf of uh, Danielle Burke and Steve Schink. Leona Hassan, we thank you so much for being here. We congratulate you on your book. Uh, I know there was a lot of love went into it, a lot of labor, but it is you have preserved something that's very precious to the Finnish people, and we thank you. And we also thank you for all the years of service that you gave at North Idaho College, both as a faculty member and with series like the Convocations. We will always remember that and, and, and celebrate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I. I'm sure you've enjoyed this program and found it uh, of historical interest to you. And we also want to give a special uh, thank you to Leona and all the Finnish people and invite you to be with us again this next week at the same time. We'll discuss yet another issue. Until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.